For centuries, African countries have been subjected to systemic exploitation, economic deprivation, cultural erosion, and political oppression under the rule of European powers. However, over time, this only made Africans more resilient. So, it's not shocking that Africa is witnessing a deep transition that is altering its relationship with former colonial countries and nations across Africa are taking strong moves to free themselves from the centuries-old constraints of exploitation. Former colonial powers that have historically plundered African resources for their own gain are coming to terms with the fact that they are no longer the dominant forces they once were. As a result, these colonial powers are now seeking assistance from Africa, signaling a seismic shift in the dynamics between the continents. In this video, we are going to be looking at the history of Africa you never knew. But first, please leave a like and a sub on the channel so more people can see our content. To begin with, Africa's rise on the global scene is a driving force behind this revolution. The continent's exceptional economic growth, booming middle class, and rising worldwide significance have positioned it as a strong competitor in the global arena. This newfound power enables African states to assert their rights, renegotiate commercial deals, and seek restitution for historical wrongs. It demonstrates Africa's growing influence and dedication to achieving economic independence. At the same time, Europe's recognition of its waning power and significance in Africa is an important development. Former colonial countries are witnessing a shifting world order in which Africa is emerging as an important participant. The age of exploiting African resources to fuel European wealth is swiftly coming to an end, and Europe's reliance on African nations is growing. This fundamental shift highlights the tremendous changes that are occurring in international trade, politics and diplomacy. The developing link between the continents was highlighted in a recent address by European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen. In her speech, she admitted that Europe is increasingly reliant on Africa and its resources to maintain its own future. This lecture provides as a painful reminder of the complexity and ambiguities underlying Africa's historical exploitation while also recognizing Africa's rise in the global arena. Understanding Europe's intentions can be difficult at times. The President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, recently met with African leaders. It's worth noting that these encounters are taking place during a period of tremendous change in the worldwide arena. As the BRICS nations expand and more countries align with Russia and China's influence, Europe's sphere of engagement has significantly narrowed. Africa stands out as a powerful continent with priceless resources, with the ability to affect global dynamics. Given Africa's significant impact, Allying with African countries can confer a position of global leadership. Historically, European nations exploited this power, frequently treating African kings as puppets. However, the dynamics have changed, prompting concern and anxiety across Europe. Ursula von der Leyen, in her own words, highlighted that Europe's objectives go beyond resource extraction. They want to build partnerships that produce local value chains and job possibilities in Africa. It's vital to take a moment to reflect on the underlying message here. Europe's position that it is not just focused on resource extraction acknowledges the continent's long history of resource exploitation. Surprisingly, there is no clear sadness or remorse in this acknowledgement. Rather, it is depicted as justification for Europe's continuous exploitation of African resources, albeit with some partial benefits in return. This proves that European politicians still have a colonial mindset. 
Perhaps their desires are motivated by malice and a colonial mindset, but in reality, they lack much clout. They profited by exploiting Africa and its riches, a practice that has now come to an end. Europe has stated its intention to develop local value chains in Africa, but it is critical to ask who Europe genuinely represents when it comes to assisting Africa. A fundamental shift in global view is required since, in this power balance, Africa, not Europe, wields substantial influence. As a result, Europe must stop belittling itself or risk becoming a laughingstock on the global stage. The comment made, implying that Europe's interests go beyond resource extraction, was a major blunder. Whether that was an unintended slip of the tongue or a reflection of Europe's genuine thinking, it revealed Europe's position. While speaking, the man appeared to be speaking on behalf of the entire continent of Europe. In a recent remark, the speaker emphasized Europe's determination to invest in the capabilities of local people, particularly young children involved in dangerous jobs such as gold mine, which serves as a critical resource supply for European industry. What is most noticeable about her statement is the lack of any obvious sense of shame or ethical concern. This unrepentant posture suggests that Europe is ready to commit major resources to this cause, with the ultimate goal of African countries becoming more important suppliers to the European market. The speaker's delivery of these ideas is characterized by an apparent lack of logic or empathy, raising questions about the ethical consequences of these goals. Her candor appears to be a candid reveal of the lengths to which Europe may be willing to go to achieve its resource demands. This apparent disregard for the welfare and rights of young children engaged in hazardous labor emphasizes the crucial need for a critical evaluation of the global supply chain and the ethical duties of countries and corporations participating in resource extraction. The speaker also emphasizes the necessity of international oversight, laws, and ethical standards in ensuring worker, fairness, and the protection of vulnerable groups. It is a harsh reminder of the critical need for a worldwide discourse about responsible sourcing, ethical trading practices, and the significance of supporting local communities rather than exploiting their resources without consideration for their well-being. Finally, the speaker's remarks put light on a sensitive topic that requires immediate attention, contemplation, and action to protect the rights and dignity of those involved in resource extraction while also promoting more ethical and responsible corporate practices on a worldwide scale. The need to put the speaker's claims into doubt arises from a larger framework of global power, dynamics and economic linkages. Europe and the United States have expressed rising concerns about China's economic and geopolitical dominance, prompting them to implement risk aversion tactics and diversify their trade relationships. While reasonable from their perspective, this cautious attitude is regarded differently in Africa. Diversifying alliances and partnerships is considered as a crucial component of this region's strategic objectives, expressing a desire to lessen reliance on any single economic or political force, similar to how Europe strives to diversify its supply chains. The idea that Europe considers punting its issues onto Africa implies that a more egalitarian and collaborative solution to global difficulties is required. Instead of expecting Africa to accommodate Europe's objectives, a call for mutual cooperation and conversation has been issued. Africa's lack of interest in risk reduction techniques aimed at isolating China in international commerce highlights the possibility that these strategies do not correspond with the continent's interests or the complex economic links it seeks to preserve.
the connection to Ursula von der Leyen's statement about having the same unity of purpose with Africa as with Ukraine emphasizes the importance of consistent and sincere involvement with Africa. It emphasizes the concept that Africa should not be viewed as a subsidiary concern, but rather as an area of equal importance in global politics. The argument that Africa does not rely on Europe and that Europe needs Africa reflects the changing global situation. Indeed, decades of European affluence have been linked to a history of colonial exploitation, but this age is coming to an end. The evolving economic and geopolitical landscape of Europe necessitates adaptation and collaboration with a broad collection of nations. While African leaders may have heard the speaker's words, their lack of interest indicates their long-standing desire for change. Europe's past reluctance to abandon exploitative methods is considered as an obstacle to a more egalitarian and mutually successful global collaboration, which is becoming increasingly important in a fast-changing world. This argues that international interactions should be more inclusive, cooperative, and courteous. The changing scenario in Africa has pushed Europe to reconsider renewing its connection with the continent. This re-engagement attempt, however, is perceived as arriving late to the scene. Drawing on their historical experiences, African leaders handle this issue with prudence, avoiding the prior mistake of placing excessive reliance in European forces. Instead, they are steadfast in their determination to establish Africa as a vital global player where power and influence will gradually gravitate. Africa's cautious attitude requires an awareness of the historical framework in which Africa and Europe have interacted. Historically, contacts were frequently marked by exploitative colonialism in which European powers sought to control and plunder resources from African states. These events have left an indelible mark on African leaders who are apprehensive of engaging into partnerships with Europe without clear benefits and protections. Africa's leaders are determined to establish themselves on the global arena. Engaging with a greater spectrum of international actors and pursuing mutually beneficial ties as the continent enjoys economic growth and increased political agency. For many years, unfavorable preconceptions and images of Africa have persisted, depicting it as a continent plagued by poverty, military dictators, authoritarian governments, a corrupt political system, malnutrition, hunger, and mass emigration. These cliches have frequently ignored the intricate network of underlying political, economic, and historical variables that contribute to these difficulties. By focusing primarily on these surface-level challenges, the world has frequently failed to realize Africa's potential, diversity, and resilience. The negative perception of Africa generally attributed to Europe has shaped the continent's historical and modern connections with the rest of the globe. This depiction is a useful tool for Europe in justifying its exploitation of Africa's huge natural resources. By painting Africa in a negative light, Europe is able to justify its economic interests and resource extraction efforts, making it easier to engage in exploitative behaviors without meeting considerable criticism or scrutiny. What must be understood is that Europe has historically played a substantial part in creating many of the difficulties that Africa now faces. Colonialism has left an enduring legacy of resource extraction, exploitation, and political manipulation on the continent. Furthermore, the colonial era's imposition of European government and economic institutions contributed to the fundamental difficulties that Africa faces today. These difficulties range from political insecurity and economic inequality to social and environmental issues. 
In the modern era, the unfavorable portrayal of Africa serves a twofold purpose. On the one hand, it diminishes African nations' resistance to the capitalist economic systems imposed on them. By portraying Africa as a problematic region, efforts to challenge the established system and advocate for more fair economic models are undermined. On the other hand, this picture lends credibility to international interventions in Africa, which are frequently carried out under the pretense of advancing democracy and human rights. In actuality, these interventions may serve the interests of external forces more than African nations. When it comes to pre-colonial Africa, it's critical to remember that the continent has a long history of prosperity and cultural diversity. Despite dealing with a major issue prior to colonialism, notably slavery, Africa maintained a distinct community method of production and societal institutions. However, when the Western world shifted from feudalism to capitalism, the continent suffered dramatic shifts. This change substantially impacted the global economic landscape, with Africa being embroiled in the roughly 350-year-long Atlantic slave trade. During this terrible era, around 11.8 million people were captured and transported, with an estimated 10 million surviving the perilous journey to be sold into slavery in the Americas. The slave trade had a significant impact on Africa's workforce, particularly among its young men and women. Slavery had far-reaching and tragic consequences that reverberated throughout the continent's history. It is critical to recognize that, in the absence of these negative repercussions, the African people has enormous potential to contribute positively to the continent's economic progress, the slave trade was more than just a result of historical circumstances. It was a driving force in the development of the European capitalist elite. Private ownership of manufacturing resources combined with the exploitation of enslaved labor provided a perfect storm for capital accumulation. This arrangement allowed those who controlled the means of production to gain enormous wealth while exploiting the labor of enslaved people. Following the discovery of gold in Brazil, the deliberate manipulation of the gold supply, notably from Africa's gold-rich regions such as Ghana, was a premeditated effort to bolster the slave trade. This strategic strategy sought to shift resources away from productive economic pursuits and onto the trading of enslaved people. It was a glaring example of how commercial interests were emphasized over the African continent's well-being and progress. Furthermore, the slave trade depleted labor resources for critical agricultural activities in Africa. This depletion has disastrous repercussions, causing famine and suffering in several African countries. Slavery damaged local economies and left people struggling to meet fundamental requirements. The weakening of Britain's slave system during this critical historical period can be attributed to a convergence of multifaceted factors that collectively reshaped the economic dynamics and the role of slavery in British colonies. First, soil exhaustion in colonies where cash crops like sugar and tobacco were cultivated had a profound impact. The continuous cultivation of these crops depleted the soil's fertility rendering many plantations less economically viable. As a result of the slave trade's diminishing relevance in a more industrialized economy, Britain was forced to engage in direct imperialism on the African continent. This imperialism intended to secure resources to sustain the rapidly expanding industrial sector, signaling a dramatic shift in resource acquisition techniques. The Industrial Revolution was the culmination of these shifts and a watershed moment in Western capitalism. It resulted in a slew of technological breakthroughs, boosted productivity, and dramatically transformed the economic landscape. 
Notably, the Industrial Revolution demonstrated that industrial capitalism could thrive without the labor-intensive and morally dubious practice of slavery changing the future of Western countries. The shift from an agrarian-based economy to an industrial one presented a compelling argument for ending the slave trade. With the cessation of slave labor, there arose a necessity for an alternative system that could sustain the generation of profits vital for the growth and accumulation of the capitalist system. The primitive accumulation of wealth resulting from slavery and international trade laid the foundation for the economic upsurge that transpired between the 1840s and the 1870s. This era witnessed the industrialization of European nations, which further fortified the underpinnings of the capitalist political economy. During the period from 1850 to 1870, international trade saw a remarkable surge of 260%. Nonetheless, this economic boom abruptly came to a halt in the early 1870s, prompting European nations to explore new sources of raw materials and markets as they endeavoured to recover lost profits. This pursuit drove European countries to initiate colonialism with the aim of gaining political control over African states, exploiting them for the economic sustenance of European capitalism was the primary objective. By the period spanning from 1870 to 1900, almost the entire African continent had come under colonial rule, with only a few exceptions. This era of colonialism was characterized by a spectrum of violence, with one of the most significant aspects being the coercive imposition of the capitalist political economy over existing primitive economic systems. Colonialism emerged as a direct consequence of the inherent contradictions within capitalism. As the profit rate declined at a certain stage, countries were compelled to search for new territories and environments to perpetuate capitalist production exploitation and profit generation. For the comprehensive integration of Africa into the capitalist political economy, there was a need for a unified monetary system for trade and exchange. Local currencies like the gold diner, gold dust, cloth, copper, iron and cowries had traditionally been used for transactions in Africa. However, colonial powers systematically eradicated these pre-colonial currencies. They confiscated land from local populations, compensated wage laborers with European currency, imposed taxes payable in European currency, and introduced an exclusive banking system that operated solely in colonialist currency. This pattern continues to persist, epitomized by currencies like the CFA franc and others. These measures stripped local populations of their land and their subsistence agriculture, compelling them to redirect their remaining production towards the demands of the colonial markets. To fulfill their tax obligations, the process of proletarianization, which involves transitioning from self-employment in the peasant class to becoming wage laborers, led to significant mass migrations towards wage labor. This, in turn, generated substantial profits for the colonial powers. The economic interests of the colonial metropolises were met, and the colonies were transformed into suppliers of raw materials with a single dominant crop, lacking diversification or industrialization. Even though the colonizers invested in infrastructure and administrative systems, their primary objective was to facilitate the transportation of goods and maximize profit extraction, rather than promoting local development. All investments were made with the aim of maximizing profit recovery in the shortest possible time, and they were not seen as essential costs for running the colonies. This deliberate neglect of industrial development in the colonies aimed to keep them reliant on manufactured goods from the colonial powers. African labor was ruthlessly exploited to extract the abundant resources of the continent, 
resulting in significant profits. By employing a combination of political and military dominance and promoting a fabricated notion of racial superiority, colonial powers maximized their exploitation of African labor. The stark disparity in wages and working conditions between African and white workers served as a clear indicator of the heightened exploitation faced by Africans. The shift towards cash crops for the market economy compelled a majority of Africans to abandon subsistence agriculture, leading to widespread hunger and famine across the continent. The initial concept behind the Italian colonization of Eritrea, initially designed as an agricultural colony to address agricultural deficiencies in Italy, carried significant importance. The colonialists seized extensive tracts of arable land amounting to approximately 412,192 hectares between 1893 and 1895, which represented over one-fifth of Eritrea's total cultivable land. This land seizure deprived the local population of their land and means of livelihood. Additionally, the wage disparity between Italians and indigenous people highlighted the extent of Italian colonial exploitation. Industrial development was deliberately discouraged to maintain Eritrea's dependency on Italian goods. Consequently, the colonial policies that facilitated land appropriation left Eritrea functioning primarily as a supplier of raw materials, reliant on Italian goods. It's the president of the European Commission expecting Africa to provide free labor for Europe's overall development once more. Well, if they are, they are mistaken. The introduction of cocoa cultivation in Ghana in 1885 had a profound impact. It led to the discouragement of other agricultural activities, and by 1901, Ghana had become the world's largest cocoa producer. By 1931, cocoa constituted roughly 80% of its exports. This shift had implications for traditional food crops, land use practices, and farming methods, resulting in regional disparities in development and a heavy reliance on a few export crops. Furthermore, colonial banks made use of African savings to generate capital for loans to European businessmen. All earnings in Africa were spent on importing finished goods, impeding capital accumulation and fostering dependency on foreign capital. Even though colonialism in Africa came to an end, marking a political liberation, it did not translate into economic autonomy. The post-World War II political and economic system that emerged promoting liberalism and free trade brought together nations with varying levels of development to compete in the global market. This arrangement perpetuated exploitative structures rooted in Africa's history during both pre-colonial and colonial periods. Africa, due to its historical lack of access to technology, capital, and skilled human resources, remained trapped in the role of a primary goods producer and supplier to the global market. It lacked the industries to manufacture goods as desired by the colonial powers. The oil crisis of the 1970s and the subsequent debt crisis once again exposed African economic, social, and political spheres to the influence of former colonial powers. Neoliberalism made its way into Africa through structural adjustment programs that focused on aspects like trade liberalization, investment deregulation, privatization of public utilities, and reforms across various sectors, including agriculture, labor markets, and pensions. The implementation of trade policies and financial sector reforms that favored international enterprises had the effect of sidelining small and medium-sized enterprises from the market. Agriculture reforms disrupted diversified cultivation and led to food security instability. 
privatization resulted in reduced real wages and diminished public expenditure, impacting the quality of healthcare and education. As a result, the growth performance of many countries dipped below the levels observed in the 1960s. Centuries of exploitation and underdevelopment on the African continent have created a situation where various ethnic, religious, and tribal groups vie for political power, which grants them access to economic resources. This has unfortunately led to civil wars, displacement of large populations, and forced migration to the West. Now, as Africa moves to undo the structural changes imposed by European powers, the President of the European Commission is calling on African leaders to maintain these destructive policies. She has essentially asked Africa to be a greater supplier of raw materials so that Europe can continue its exploitation. The question is whether Europe expects Africa to allow this to happen again. The resounding answer is no. The issue at hand is whether African leaders should forge ties with European countries or keep them at a distance. What are your thoughts on whether African leaders should allow European countries to establish these ties? We must ensure that Africa is not afforded any opportunity to be exploited by external powers in the future. It's crucial to outline what actions Africa should take now, given its prominent status and influence. If you're interested in watching more videos on these topics, please subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell icon. We are committed to producing videos on subjects often overlooked, such as black culture, civilization, history, and evidence highlighting the remarkable contributions of black communities. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for our next video.